we the pro the, the farm here is about we're about 480 hectares. Um, we're 480 hectares, which is about 1,200 acres. Um, it includes um, it's a mixed cropping farm, which is um, mainly cropping, but we also have about 14 or 1,500 sheep as well, uh, which we mix in to the system. Um, we have um, our, our main arable crop is cereals, and uh, we're on what. Um, you know, what the locals class as marginal land. So we're marginal cropping land, which means that the crop area is limited to the contour to whether we can get across the ground or not. So, um, and uh, yeah, so that's where the no tillage came in was um, we got into, I've been told that we got into no tillage for the right reasons, which is the more the environmental reasons than the lifestyle reasons. So um, it's just really to try to, um, to minimize the amount of erosion and to maximize the amount of production that we can get off the ground in a sustainable way. Yeah, we we have to be we do have to be very careful with um, with erosion, which um, uh, like it's the the main the main problem with the with erosion here happens through cultivation through implement downdraft. So uh, we just we use the no tillage to overcome like it, it basically turns turns um, hills into flat because we can grow the same crops, we can run the same, a similar rotation, although around the other way, but we can run a similar rotation to what we do on the flat. When you run a no tillage system, we've got to be very aware that we only get one chance at it. It's um, the, it, being a single pass system, the only pass that we do is the one that counts. So we've got to get it right first time. And uh, that means there will be, um, yeah, there, there could be all sorts of issues in the paddock and we've just got to be able to, um, to, the, the drill's got to be able to instantly cope with them as we're, as we're getting along. Um, we, we, when we were looking at the, at the various drills, we found that um, because cross-lot drills are the only drill that were made specifically for, for, no, for a no-tillage situation, they were the only drills that could, act, you know, that could do the job 100% of the time, 100% of the time. Um, every other drill on the market seemed to be, a, um, it seemed to be an, an adaptation of a... Um, cultivation drill. Um, I think the main advantage with cross lot is the is the fertilizer placement. There are other drills on the market that will put fertilizer down the spout, as they say, but the placement is very important when we like we use a lot of high analysis fertilizers. The the more I read, the more I f I find how important it is to get fertilizer placement right. Um, the I didn't realise in the past how immobile phosphate is, for instance, and uh, N and P are the most, to me, they're the most um, important um, nutrients to get down the spout. Um, it's, it's more in the case of our soils, our soil type rather than our contour. Uh, the soil type, because we're on a, we're on a very, we're on silt soils with a very heavy um, deep clay base, which means that we don't get leaching. Our leaching, if we do get it, tends to be runoff rather than, um, rather than, um, through, you know, leaching through the soils, through the soil profile. So to pile it all on top is asking for trouble. We just end up with giving it to the neighbours. Um, we're dealing with, um, in most cases, we're dealing with residue levels here in the cereals of between anywhere from six tonne to 10 tonne to the hectare if we're not bailing off. So residue, the, the ability of the drill to handle residue is very important to us. On our place here, we have a variety of of soils and soil profiles to deal with. They, like they just vary so much even in one block, even on, on one field, we may end up with, um, like there's so many different um, challenges that the drill has to cope with. And like it may be humps, hollows, wet, dry, clay, soil, um, hard, soft. There could be all sorts of uh, vehicle tracks, you know, compaction, that sort of thing. So um, the drill's got to be able to cope with them instantly in a one pass system. So and the cross lot is just magnificent at doing that because of its ability, the ability to control depth and pressure on the go. I've been uh, in no tillage, uh, fully no tillage for the last 15 years. Uh, I tro chose cross lot back in the mid 90s, uh, primarily because of uh, three things. Uh, one was residue management and also fertilizer placement and the ability with depth control was very important to me 
and I also felt that um, at that stage that they had more knowledge and no tillage than a lot of other people when they were dedicated no tillage people. We're on um, this cropping farm here, we're on a what we call a Lismore medium to light stone, so we have a lot of surface stone and uh, in the last 15 years we're virtually, um, by less disturbance, we have not much stone left on the surface um, and uh, and our organic matter has improved substantially to the stage that um, these soils are holding another 14 mils of water than a traditionally cultivated farm. So that's another three and a half to four days on an irrigation round, added to an irrigation round. Our stones uh, were um, basically by uh, leaving minimal disturbance, the uh, worms and the act microbial activity have allowed the soil to move up ab above the stones and created a very, very good tilthy surface on the top. And uh, that, this farm has just changed so much in the last 15 years because of that. Um, since we've been to no, gone to no tillage, uh, we've had independent uh, irrigation experts come in here. And on average, this property over the season by uh, not cultivating it and allowing the soil to be exposed to the nor'westers, we're saving an average of um, between 40 and 60 millimetres of, of water per year uh, through loss of, by not allowing the soil to be exposed for evapotranspiration. We're a fully intensive far cropping farm that is uh, irrigated, and every mill of water I value at $2 a mill. So um, at, at say 40, hec 40 millimetres of moisture, if you lose that at $2 a mil, you're on a farm in Canterbury uh, here that is exposed to um, very, very strong nor'westers at certain times. Um, having soil exposed, this is where you lose moisture and also lose soil. Um, we have had minimal wind blow on this farm in the last 15 years compared to the cultivated farms around me. Uh, we've gone from averaging four to five tonne of sort of feed grains uh, up to the um, around 11 and a half to 12 tonne mark on these light lismores and so we're getting close to some of the um, the best Wakanui's yields in, in New Zealand. Um, our ryegrass yields are similar from um, 1200 kilograms a hectare to 2200 to 2000 and we've had yields up to 3,300 kilograms a hectare. In all, in all cropping farms, death control is a very, very important issue. You've got to, you, it's, it's uh, to do with slugs, it's to, if you've got things like that, um, and it's also to do with uh, bird damage, so you, and, and your press wheel cover, you've got to have good depth control so that you're minimising the risks of any pests coming in and, and causing any grief in that crop. This farm is, uh, is uh, a very, very, what I consider a very low cost machinery farm um, and whilst we haven't got a big drill, uh, we can do two and a half hectares an hour comfortably um, and we're very comfortable with that. What you've got to bear in mind, that's all we're doing, we're just pulling out of the shed, drilling in the paddock and pulling back in the shed. Um, if we were doing it conventionally, we would be ploughing uh, minimum top down and then drilling. Uh, which would require at least a minimum of two, maybe three passes. Um, so uh, that's what we do here. Yeah, we've been uh, contracting since 1996. We're running two drills and uh, drilling approximately 4,000 hectares annually. Uh, the drills are extremely reliable. We've found that um, the, the parts uh, are very robust and um, very, very few bearings need replacing uh, over, um, over that period. Uh, the reliability of the machine is, is paramount to us and our customers. Uh, it's so important that we give our customers the best crops that they can grow in a wide range of conditions. And um, the cross lot achieves this magnificently, the difference that the fertiliser down placed near the seed makes is, is stand out. Uh, we see time and time again where um, drills that don't do this suffer uh, poorer yields.
over the last several years, our crops have placed very highly in the forage crop competitions in our local uh, local winter feed competition. Yeah, we we sow a lot of small seeds and. Um, in, in various conditions, from very soft soils to some very stony, uh, bouldery type riverbed conditions, and the, the machine's ability to maintain its depth control uh, in these conditions is, is fabulous. Yeah, the reliable, reliability of the opener to maintain good seed depth and uh, placement through high residues is, is great. We, uh, we sow into 10 to 12 tonne per hectare of residue and, and get great results. I guess much of our work um, is, is around forage cropping and, and high yielding crops and our farmers demand uh, you know, extremely high yields and the fertiliser placement certainly um, lends to that. In Canterbury here we have um, extremely strong northwest fern winds through the summer months. The, uh, the, the damage this causes in terms of soil erosion is huge and no tillage and particularly the cross lot and its low disturbance and uh, leaving the residue in place certainly uh, has massive advantage to our customers. Yes, no, sir, our customers regularly comment on the emergence that the cross lot provides, the evenness across the fields, um, particularly in, with, with peas into, into pastoral or ex-pastoral conditions, um, brassicas do come up very evenly um, and is noticeable. You can basically pick out the crops that have been cross lotted in the district. Yes, yeah, for, for us, the, the, the drills uh, ease and ability to, to set up for different soil conditions in terms of changing discs and blades is, is extremely easy. Uh, the, the wearing parts on this drill are essentially just the, the discs and blades and these are very easy to, to replace and, and adjust. Um, takes very little time in the field to, to do this with very few tools. Um, I work around this area in Western Victoria. Um, I find I'm doing a lot more of the difficult jobs uh, other contractors won't take on, can't get the results. The machinery can't handle the punishment it takes. Um, working from very rocky country, to a very heavy um, flats, which I think is the stuff that they make cricket pitches out of, that, that gooey. Didn't start off contracting, started off um, doing experimental work on my own place um, with no tillage uh, the way I wanted to go, even though I was read um, strict um, cultivation um, teachings. Um, I thought there had to be better ways. We are running into problems with pugging in the winter after the ground had been cultivated and sown down. The traffic ability wasn't there. Um, we tried various machines, um, adaptions to what was called Baker boots put onto a modified um, springtime combines. Um, I thought we were getting somewhere, but we, were, we didn't have the soil conditions ideal. Um, we were getting failures. Um, then purchased a uh, triple disc drill with a single press wheel behind it and the first year we had that we thought that was absolutely marvellous but now we look back we, we had absolutely ideal soil conditions. Um, we used that for three years but each year I was becoming more disillusioned with the results I was getting with it. Um, we were running into penetration problems, we weren't able to close the slot, the seed was just laying in the open. Um, we didn't know a great deal at that stage about slugs, but we realised that it was just laying there as soon as it germinated, the slugs were helping themselves to it. Um, I was at a crossroads, what do I do, where do I go to? And uh, talking to um, a New Zealand uh, farmer that's over here and what I was wanting to do, and he said, have you ever heard of a cross lot? Didn't know what it was. Um, we got on the internet and found a bit about it. Um, a phone call to New Zealand and um, a week later I was in New Zealand doing a, um, um, looking at an investigation of what was over there and before I left New Zealand I'd ordered a drill and I think it's the best move I ever made. Well the things that I've been able to supply to them is that um, we get um, very good germination and establishment. Um, 
and that's because we can get into this, we um, can follow the contours of the ground, we can penetrate the difficult soils, come out of difficult uh, penetration into soft penetration, the drill makes its own adjustments and uh, we keep the soil, uh, the seed uh, placement at the same depth in the ground all the time. Um, and by able to put fertiliser down and separate to it, um, not getting any root burn, uh, we're able to enhance our germination and establishment. Oh, it's, I think it's very critical. Um, we can put high volumes of nitrogenous fertilisers down there um, and no fear of scolding the plants. We've actually put capital doses of um, complete fertilisers, N, P and K, down there. Um, there's a farmer that introduced me to cross lot um, a couple of occasions we put 350 kilos of, um, I think the mixture was about uh, 10 of N, 20 of P and, and 25 of K. Well, if you tried to do that with any other machine, you'd completely um, eliminate germination. We're looking for a machine that can handle the, um, the difficult terrain that we go into, the stones, um, the hard soils. Um, and that's what we've got with the cross lot. We can, it's robust, it's got the weight. We can transfer the weight onto the openers to get our penetration down there. Um, the triple disc machine I had was just springs. I think we had about 150 kilos per opener. Uh, with the cross lot, we were working on about 440 kilos of, um, of mass per opener. Uh, rye grass is in the autumn, cereals in the autumn. Um, in the springtime, we're lucerns, um, brassicas, chicory, plantain, um, and hadn't, haven't come across a, a, um, a seed yet that we haven't been able to put in with a cross lot and get good results. People that have used me for the first time and have been sitting on the fence looking at what the neighbours are doing, um, they're very, very pleased and presently surprised that the, um, the establishment we get for them, we don't get patchy establishment. They get continuous drill rollers from one end of the paddock to the other. Okay, yeah, well, farming here with uh, Peter Jeffrey, my neighbour next door, and uh, between us, we're, we're cropping uh, a bit over 4,000 acres between the two farms, and we've set up a, uh, a partnership where we're sharing the machinery. So we've, we've bought the uh, cross slot seeder between us, and we're sharing other machinery. We're essentially running the two farms. As, uh, as one management unit now and, um, and doing it that way. Uh, and that's basically because we want to uh, share labour and share resources to uh, give us economies of scale. Well, traditionally we, uh, we're in a 20 inch rainfall. Uh, the last um, probably six years we've, we've, uh, we haven't managed 10 inches or less than, uh, less than 10 inches in any growing season. Uh, and we're sort of aiming for crops in that five to six tonne hectare for cereals or better. Uh, but we've been lucky to maintain probably half that um, in the last uh, six years. Well, we've sort of converted over to, I guess, minimum tillage in the last 10 years where we've been using knife points on a combine. and um, We've best got away from the traditional cultivation um, and sowing operations. And I guess it's been an evolution to keep that, um, that momentum going in, in changing our operation where we wanted to fully retain our stubbles. Uh, we've traditionally always burned our stubbles, um, which we've wanted to get away from. And so we've always, I guess for the last five years, we've been looking for a machine that's been able to handle um, the stubble. We've been traditionally on 12 inch rows, uh, sorry, on eight inch rows, and we've gone out to, uh, to um, 12 and a half inch rows now. And we want to um, sow into that stubble under any condition and, and leave it there, and, and using a, a combination of uh, cereals, pulses and, and canola in our rotation. Yeah, look, I guess the, the moisture conservation is, is the biggest thing for us, because like I said, we can have years where we're only getting um, uh, 200 millimetres of growing season rainfall, and uh, traditionally we'd be expecting sort of in the realms of 350 to 400 millimetre rainfall. So. I guess that's probably that would be the biggest driver in that, and and it's, and it's also just the fact that we wanted to get away from having to burn stubbles. Um, we we just couldn't see any in future in it because uh, we're just burning all that um, all that residue, and we just wanted to be able to incorporate those stubbles to because I mean our soils, Australian soils, are very low in um, organic carbon to start with, um, so any organic matter that we can put back into the system uh, is only only um, 
improving the structure of our soils. I mean, we've seen it since we've gone uh, to tram lining in the last eight years, where we've been running our cedar and spraying and spreading operations on on uh, permanent wheel tracks. That the uh, the soil structure um, changes that have occurred in the areas that aren't um, trafficked, and to be able to take that now to a, a full controlled traffic system is um, where we'll see that next that uh, next step in in uh, production. Uh, I mean, with the with the tined machines. It was no better than the seed placement was, so it was it was variable. Um, but yeah, being able to put the the fertilizer, one being able to band it separately from the seed, and being able to place it exactly where we wanted it is it was fairly critical in in choosing the machine to do that. Well, it does because I mean, terms of trade aren't getting any better on the farm. So by joining the two farms essentially as one management unit, it meant that we could um, essentially buy uh, well. We could buy equipment that was bigger than we'd be able to purchase by ourselves and we could afford technology that was probably out, outside of our, um, our grass previously in terms of being able to afford it. Um, but see, look, the other option too is, you know, I don't necessarily think we'll sow everything on the 12 and a half inch row spacings either. We'll, we'll, we'll sow all our chickpeas and faba beans on uh, 25 inch rows and potentially even the canola, I think, will probably start. We were going to trial some this year, but we'll do some next year. Uh, we'll put some of the canola out to um, 25 inch rows and see how it goes. Because yep. I think the, once, we're, once we're in that, in that stubble situation, that the um, canola will do no trouble at all on, um, on the wider row spacings. I mean, we'll never do that with wheat, but then we want the wheat on the, on the 12, and inch, 12 and a half inch row spacings so we can actually that gives us our stubble cover because we don't get a lot of stubble out of the legumes and we get, I guess, half the amount of stubble out of the canola that we do out of the wheat. Well, it's interesting because everyone says oh, moisture is our limiting, our limiting factor, but actually I don't think it is. Even in these low rainfall years, I still don't think moisture is our limiting factor. Like it is in terms of in what we relative yield, but I still see that the stubble is actually the biggest limiting factor because I've got uh, paddocks where we've sown. A classic was in 2006, we had faba beans direct drilled into a wheat stubble, which we'd uh, attempted to do, but we're getting too many blockages. So we burnt the rest of the paddock that we hadn't sown. And when we harvested, the faba beans in the, in the stubble were only 600 kilos a hectare, but it was only 300 kilos a hectare where we harvest, where we'd burnt the stubble. So actually, I think the the residue is actually probably our biggest limiting factor. But in terms of our yield potential, it's interesting that we can push eight, nine tonne a hectare on the irrigation, and really there's no reason why we can't do that if we've got ample moisture in spring. Why we can't do eight, nine, ten tonne a hectare in um, in our dryland crops. We've seen on the yield monitor last year. We saw that we had wheat going up uh, to 10 tonne a hectare on, on the irrigation. And that was essentially only two irrigations, which was equivalent to what a, a reasonable spring, spring would have been. So I think our cereal, our cereal yield potential is 10 tonne a hectare, but we won't get that unless we've got residue on the ground. Yeah, we're just looking at the long term, like in 20 years' time, if we keep ploughing it, uh, we'll probably get half the yield, so... And it's an easy way of doing it, I don't feel like bouncing over the furrow anymore, it's pretty hard on the body. And just the, the ease of it really, with the crane, not going to hurt your back, and... Uh, um, yeah, well, we used to have another guy which was full-time, he'd probably be on the power harrow for six weeks without getting off, and now we're, well, it's just down to me now. So, it's one week or less, and the old man just does all the spraying, so... It's pretty easy when the weather's on your side. Yep. But no, it definitely works good anyway. And some of these sand hills we've crossed on as well. In the old days we used to plough it all. And you'd come in the drive and go of course westerly you'd see the old sand all coming off and yeah, that doesn't happen now. So, Because some of these sand hills are where we're going to go in a minute but, uh, still grow quite good crops. So um, if we can keep that soil there it's all good. Expenses are um, yeah, half probably. And you're trapped, you're not clicking all your machinery, re, re, um, you know, off your, all your power harrows that you're usually wearing out and just never ending. So we haven't got that now and the fuel's half, so.
we somehow got hold of Nathan and, and he came down, which was very nice of him, and, and, um, and just drilled, drilled through all this bloody fatting, which was that high, which we'd sprayed three or four times and nothing worked at huge expense. And um, yeah, so, so that sort of got us thinking a bit. And, uh, and then it, it's just been a bit of a natural progression. We, we had a few trial runs where we did a cross slot paddock next to a um, conventional paddock and that sort of thing. And, and um, we did take a bit of convincing, but, uh, but now we're all pretty much cross slot. And, uh, but yeah, that was the real beauty of that. When, when we make major mistakes, the cross slot can kind of come in and tidy them up. Mm. Yeah, that's to me the big, um, the big advantage of the direct drilling versus the cultivation is, is in the springtime, um, we can go from being very wet to very dry pretty quickly and, and um, um, you know, I used to see the, putting the crops in, in, a, in a screaming northwest and there's this big cloud of dust which was all just the topsoil, you know. And um, I guess we, we can now go and when conditions are right, spray it out, drill it that day almost and uh, we're straight, there's not, not that downtime of the three or four week period by the time you put a plough in the ground to the, by the time you get the seed in the ground. And that's a big, uh, big plus. We used to have to take out our paddocks early, which would penalise the stock, so we'd get the crops in on time, because you had to come forward another three or four weeks. So that has been a huge advantage. I wouldn't know. It probably hasn't increased our carrying capacity, but it, what it's done is it allowed us to hang on, hang on to stock in that good time of the year where they're growing fast for longer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that, yeah, I guess if you're coming out of grass, um, the animals have got that paddock for another three weeks, so, than what they would normally have if we were ploughing it. Yeah, well, we have tried another couple of uh, drills when we were sort of trying things out, and um, admittedly, they were the lower end drills, I suppose, looking back, but, uh, you know, we just got some disasters, and... Um, but we're just getting such good results that it's, you know. To be honest, I haven't tried anything else recently, so I, I can't really comment, but we seem to be getting pretty good results. And, and they've been bloody awful seasons the last two or three years, you know. So um, it's certainly when you walk over a new grass paddock, it feels a lot more spongier than it used to and things like that, which I guess is a good thing. There's plenty of um, evidence out there that... that uh, you can you can crop continually with it, and uh, which which with conventional method they, they was running into problems. So, you know there is that option there. I guess a lot of people say to me, "Oh, you should have your own drill," and and um, and that's probably fair comment. But um, what Matt does in a week when he's got two drivers and the drill's going 24 hours a day would take us probably three weeks to do. So I don't know whether we'd be much better off. We've got uh, probably about 20 hectares of uh, lucerne at the moment too. Um, we've got one paddock which has run out down here now, and about 15 on some stony river flats on the on the lease block out there. Um, that was all all cross slotted in, and uh, just just one pass, and that that was a tremendous success. It's about six to seven years old now. It's just starting to run out, and we're just sort of starting to to replace it now. Yields are uh, not too bad. We did 23 ton on our maize this year. Um, we originally started with a cross slot. Um, because obviously the, the no tillage idea, and um, and also the bonus of um, of having the um, putting half ton bags in. Uh, well, I've been home for about uh, 12 years now, I suppose, and the um, it was pretty pretty rough when we got here. Lots of big paddocks and water was limited and stuff. Um, so we sort of we're trying to turn off turn over as much ground. We're doing about 100 hectares a year, and um, if you're doing that, well, you guys would know that when you didn't have a cross lot, putting bag fit through that when you're doing that sort of. Um, Doing that sort of area, so that's a lot of bags to handle. So that was uh, one of the original. That was also a bit of a bonus when we um, when we got into the cross The Only thing they know is is, uh, is ploughing and drilling, and that's probably how they've been through university and done their stuff. And that's that's their area of expertise. How do how do they how do they gain expertise on cross -lighting? So much more on arable crops and getting more out of it, and our livestock production has definitely lifted just by maintaining better quality pastures than the Italians through the winter. So, I think our soils have improved a bit and our drainage has improved. 
we can probably get away with a little bit more now um, after the time of no tillage. But we feel that it is definitely improved. It probably is four to five years, maybe a little bit longer on here, depending on how much damage you've done before, um, returning a bit of residue. Well, like we're sowing our barley in November a lot of the time here, and, and, and drilling into that sprayed out pasture and conserving that moisture a bit longer um, is helping the, the crop get away quicker and better. Um, but having the good soil structure and the drainage previous to that has allowed us to do a bit more of it, like t take that risk and, and spray a bit more out. But I, the pests haven't changed really, I don't think. The, um, all the diseases, you know, we try and monitor quite a bit. We probably should monitor a bit more, but, you know, just controlling the aphids and stem weevil and... <coughs> The slugs, but I don't think that's changed. Some of it, we're probably, some of it's probably getting a little bit better, possibly. And uh, we went to the fielding field days, and that was in, I think, in 2003. And Crosslight had a display there, and I'm walking past, and Dave's standing out the front, and she said, Go on, you've always wanted to do this. She said, Anyway, she went up to David and said he wants to buy one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's how I got into it. And, uh, and I was sort of reluctant to spend $300,000. But anyway, it was Lois was telling me to go and buy one that, that got us started. And Bill came down we organised what we wanted and um, it went from there. So I was trying to think of the most dramatic things that have happened to us since we've had the cross lot. And the, one of the first one has been the fact we can get on with our mould draining because the opportunity for mould draining is November, uh, with, you know, September, October, perhaps into November. And with a cross load, it's given us the ability to get in and do our mould draining before we actually go in and do the, um, uh, do the uh, sowing. So that's, that's had a dramatic effect, and we've been doing quite a bit of mould draining. It's had quite, a, quite an effect on, um, on the existing pipes and some of the new, newer pipe systems we put in. Uh, the other thing is um, it's given us opportunity, which is mentioned by the other, some of the other farms we visited, visited, to farm stock right up until virtually the day we're sowing. And that window of opportunity and the way stock grow from um, August, September and even into October is quite dramatic. And that's, that's had a huge effect on our profitability. And the other thing that's been interesting, and Paul's taken it to another level, we've had the opportunity to sow crops 12 months of the year as opposed to being locked into an autumn and spring situation. I think they sowed the last crop about a month ago. And so that's had a dramatic effect on our lifestyle and what we can do with, uh, uh, with our farm. Uh, six inch rows, so we, we did a lot of cropping in 12 inch rows that year, and from then on we managed to go down to the six, and since then we built it, and it's bigger, it's 19 run now, not 15. So it's had quite a dramatic effect on the, um, on the soil and the ability to pull a, pull a drill of that size. So that's been another plus for the, uh, for the drill. See, our soil is very vulnerable to be broken down, like uh, I think Nathan mentioned, three crops of barley. Like, you could do two crops of barley and get successful yields, but you tried for the third one, and and you, you, well, like you said, you had to throw the you throw the clumps at the, at the tractor to try and break them down. It just went very hard, and you lost all your structure. And that's been, I think, the most dramatic effect on our soils is the is the preservation of soil structure. Yeah, the only pieces that we've ever replaced since we've owned these and we've been running them for 11 years is the the actual wear components. We've never broke anything. Uh, so the discs and the blades, uh, that's it. And every once in a while we'll have an occasional bearing failure. But we pretty much eliminated that by uh, just maintaining them once a year. We strip the drills down, uh, go through the bearings, make sure they're smooth. If anything's questionable, we tear them apart, repack them. And, and if that doesn't fix them, we put new bearings in. But it's, it's been very, very minimal. I think that we've got it figured out. It's around 60 to 70 cents an acre to keep that thing in the field. Uh, my brother's pretty much the money man, so he, he'd know that better. But, but it's very, uh, compared to the conventional system that we used to be in, it's, it's, it's nothing to compare to. Fuel, yeah, fuel use is, we're down to about a gallon an acre is what we figure with the drills. Uh, this combine I'm leaning against burns more fuel in the course of a day than I do seeding and cuts about the same amount of acres. So we're, we're, we figure these are about a gallon and a half per acre and versus a gallon per acre with the, with, with the drills putting the seed in the ground.
Yeah, the spring, that was a big thing when we got into this. They kept telling us we were in a, our chemical costs were going to go through the roof. Our chemical costs haven't changed at all, other than our Roundup usage. We've increased that, but the neighbors around here have increased their Roundup usage too, because it's just a, it's a good preventative maintenance system. But for us, it's basically our entire tillage system is the Roundup. Uh, when we first started doing this, we were probably five to seven days behind the neighbors who were conventional in our soil temperatures so we could get into the field and seed. Right now, we're actually a couple days, we're either the same level or a couple days ahead of them. And because our soil just doesn't get as cold during the winter time. Uh, so that that's kind of went out the door. But I can see where there the frustration level for the first couple two or three years because you're gonna be you're gonna be sitting on your heels watching the neighbors go out there in conventional ground when you're back in the shop and uh, watching them farm. But even even those that transition period, I can't say our crops took a took a hit by any stretch. And I I don't know how to explain that any better, but. When we first started into the no-till, we were concerned about compaction. We didn't do any driving around these fields other than the combines and the trucks. And that's not been an issue since we've gotten into it. Um, during the springtime, with the, when the soil, once the soil's made that transition, we can actually get in on, we can drive across this ground where you couldn't drive across it in conventional and we do not see any results with compaction and to kind of back that up is shoot our big our wide drills 15 feet and that's the same uh that's the same width as the tractor so we literally go over every inch of this ground and you can dig down on this ground right now with your fingernails and and go as deep as you want to go so you don't have to use a shovel anymore it's no it goes just the opposite when we first started pulling those no-till drills we, uh, we've got a 425 horsepower tractor on that 15 footer and we were, we'd make her tongue hang out all day long. And now I think I could comfortably pull a 30 footer. It, it, the ground has changed, it's totally different. The longer we're in it, it's the nicer it gets. As, I don't know how to say that, but that's all I can say. <laughs> well, dad bought the Harley because he's retired, but uh, but our maintenance has gone down from, when I first came home to farm, we were full-blown conventional. And you were in the shop six days a week from eight, a short day was eight in the morning until five at night. And we worked on equipment to get it ready for the next year. And when we went, got full-blown into this no-till situation, we bring both the drills into the shop in the fall of the year and we finish seeding and we tear them completely down. When I say tear them down, we pull the discs out and the blades out and just inspect the parts. That way we know what we got to order. But it's, it's basically two days per drill. And if we got crazy, we could probably do it in a day per drill. And then we have the two tractors that we bring into the shop. And that's, that's what's been more amazing to me than anything is the tractors. We used to, uh, shoot, we used to go through a set of fan belts a year just because of the dirt that we were running through the radiator. And consequently, when you'd pull the dis dipstick out at like 100 hours, it looked like coal. And now we pull the dipstick at 100 hours, we still change it at 100 hours, but it's, it still looks like oil. So the wear and tear in the tractors has just gone to nothing. And another thing we always do to the tractors in the winter time is we pull the magnetic plugs out. And there used to be a, a lot of fur on them and they're, they're as clean as a whistle now. So that, that's really impressed me. And the other thing that's been really nice about it is it gives us a lot more time to, uh, hell, my wife gives me hell because I never go up to the shop half the time, sit around the house and uh, watch TV and enjoy life a little bit. <laughs> so, but no, the maintenance is unbelievably low. I mean, you gotta keep up on it. You can't let stuff slide, but no, it's not a big deal at all. We have been able to capture uh, moisture on the hills by leaving the stubble stand up. 
in a true no-till manner of no uh, shredding, no harrowing, nor anything other than a one-pass system with a no-till drill. Is It's like snow fences, it gathers moisture and holds it on the hills rather than lets it blow off into the draw. Snow for moisture purposes. And uh, it uh, it's, it's fun to watch some of the hills come back to life after seeing them in a conventional mo method of farming, uh, not being able to uh, produce anything because of lack of moisture. Uh, it's really hard to measure the moisture, but what I do see is we have tile lines that have quit running uh, because we're able to hold the moisture on the hills rather than let it run to the bottom of the draw and uh, leach out through the ground and leave. Uh, we don't have the wet spots we used to have in the draws. We bought a farm 30 years ago and uh, one of the neighbors came by and he said, boy, that was a bad investment because you couldn't grow anything on the hills and now we're growing stuff on the hills. And it's uh, so much more residue on tops of the soil. When we started no-till, we got into a residue, uh, uh, how much residue we have on the hills. And uh, within three years, we tripled our residue load on our hills just by no-tilling. And all it was is we always put seed to it, we put fertilizer to it, but we never had the capabilities of putting the one key ingredient was water. And after we got into the no-till with the standing stubble, uh, that was the thing that tr triggered the hills and they, they started producing. With the system we're in, we're such a low disturbance and all the microorganisms and the worms are just taking over and we, we don't have too much residue to the point where uh, we have one combine with a straw chopper, no chaff spreader. We have one combine with a chaff spreader, no straw chopper. And we have one combine with a straw chopper and chaff spreader, and we can't tell the difference of what combine went where uh, by, by having too much residue on the ground. None of the other machines come close to uh, uh, achieving what we're trying to achieve by not knocking that stubble down. Uh, the residue has become a real asset to us and uh, one of the things that was said by several people when we started this is our residue load is going to get so heavy that we won't be able to handle it after a few years. But the microorganisms and the worms have come in and uh, taken this ground and just brought it all to life. It's uh, 20 years ago I called it dirt. I call it soil today because of the simple reason it is, it's a living thing. It truly is, it's amazing. The abilities of uh, gathering moisture. Um, we have neighbors that are conventional farming around here and I'm not anybody that, however they have to farm. But it's really interesting to watch uh, the soil and water wash out of their fields and wash into ours about 20 feet and that's the last of the water erosion. We've gathered it, We've, we're gathering water now. And uh, our uh, rotation is probably a tough rotation to maintain if we lose uh, moisture because we're growing cereal crops back to back. There are several things, actually. Uh, seed placement is very important to us. Uh, able to handle all the residue without disturbing the residue. Um, we're finding out residue is a good tool, not a bad thing to have out there. Um, the runoff we don't have, it's just so many good things we have. The worms are up. The, uh, microorganisms are up. The, uh, it's just it's just a wonderful thing to see, and the cross lot system has brought us to the point where, as soon as we would disturb the the natural habitat, 
of the worms and the microorganisms, the more we disturb that, the less benefits we get out of it. It's the only drill that will um, contour the hills at a 40, 45%, 46% slope that maintains equal seed depth throughout the whole width of the drill. Uh, it's, a lot of drills have a problem in the upper side of the upper half of the drill is seeding shallow and lower half seeding deep. Uh, the drill itself just maintains that. It's got even, even depth control all the way through. It actually will hold the tractor up there to the point where if you uh, lift the drill up on the hillside, you're at the 45%, you're liable to go to the bottom with a whole outfit to get to the bottom. And then uh, you have to figure out how to get back up there. So. <laughs> For the last five seasons, we've been observing uh, fields in the Palouse region of Washington and Idaho to determine what crops are being planted, how much crop residue is in the fields, and what kind of erosion we're getting on the fields. And what we've noticed is that during those five observation periods, the only system that consistently keeps 70 to 80 percent crop residue on the soil surface is the cross slot system. And where we have most cross slot systems is in Whitman County, Washington, and in Columbia County, Washington, around the Dayton area. And it's very consistent in those fields. We've noticed that a lot of the fields in those steep rolling hills of this region have tremendous amounts of erosion if we don't keep enough crop residue on the soil surface. So it's paramount that we have a large amount of residue on those hills to protect them from serious erosion. Erosion is both uh, negatively impacting our productivity of the soils and it also has some serious site effects uh, off-site from the farms in that it clogs up our salmon streams in this region. During our surveys we also found that we have a vast difference in the adoption of no-till systems in the region. Uh, we have counties where up to 70% of the crops are planted under no-till systems and then we have counties where only about 10% of systems are planted under direct seeding. So there's a big difference in, in how these systems are adopted and it's a whole system that needs to be adopted. It's not just one piece of equipment that is gonna make the whole system work. So a cross slot drill, for instance, works as a part of an entire system that the farmers put in place, just like other brands work that way too. When I came to work for the Agricultural Research Service uh, in this Palouse region of uh, eastern Washington, our assignment was to uh, find methods of farming that would reduce the erosion in this very erosive country. Uh, we had tried many of the conventional erosion prevention measures and they had not worked, but with these kinds of steep slopes, we determined that uh, direct seeding or no-till tillage was going to be the way to do it. In order to do that, we had to find an adequate seeding drill. <clears throat> so we were testing a number of different drills, and we had tried uh, several of them with uh, moderate success or no success until we finally found the uh, cross-slot technology that was developed in New Zealand and compared it with the best that we had of the others that we tried. And after observing that uh, we got good emergence, excellent growth with the uh, banded fertilizer, the uh, really end of the story was that we also got about a 15% yield boost. So this really set the stage for the best of our no-till in the uh, Palouse region of Eastern Washington. Years ago, my family came to this country and homesteaded and broke out the prairie sod that was here and found extremely rich ground, which was beautiful, raised wonderful crops, very hard work. However, the only way they could control the weeds was with tillage. And by doing this, we eroded the ground over generations. And sitting 
and working on the farms and watching our ground degrade, it was just very, very painful. And we were watching water erosion, dust erosion, and chemical erosion. Anytime you pull a piece of equipment over these hills, you watch your ground go downhill. Even when you're plowing uphill, it doesn't stay status quo. So my dream was to find a way to farm this ground without tillage, and because of modern herbicides, we can now do that. We no longer have to till to control the weeds. And with the cross-slot drill, which the Wolfs and I, who I farmed with, we got together and found through research, and because Frank Wolf, Dan's youngest son, had been in a college class where he heard John Baker talk about the cross lot. And we found one, an old used one, managed to buy it, brought it home, and fell in love. It was not easy to get started. The newer technology is much easier to work with, but it was the answer to my dream. I now watch my land stay put, and not only are we controlling the land, and are controlling weeds that used to be a pain to our, we used to have terrible trouble with Canadian thistles and morning glory especially. What a boon, we no longer have that problem. They are still out there, but they are not aggressive like they used to be. And speaking of economics, that's another thing we've found. With this type of farming, our bottom line has improved. It's not because we are getting necessarily more crop. Our winter crops have stayed about the same as they always were. Our spring crops have improved and we are finding less disease. Other neighbors have diseases in their garbanzos. We do not know why, but our garbanzos don't have that disease. That's something that still needs to be figured out. I'm convinced it's the health of our soil. But it, back to my original premise, the bottom line has improved. Not greatly, but we don't use near the manpower. We don't use near the uh, fuel. We have less equipment to maintain. I'm just totally pleased with this type of farming and very grateful that I found Dan, Ben, and Frank to work with, because without them, I couldn't do it. We have been renting other no-tillage drills, and we're having trouble holding them up on our hillsides. Uh, they were not seeding correctly and we weren't getting the depth control we needed and we got into cross slot and the first year was a challenge but that was a lot of learning curve we now are able to hold those drills up we can use the same tractors we were farming with before we didn't have to get huge tractors and it is just working out very nicely and i'm real pleased with the crops that i see growing out in those fields one problem we do have and it's a nice frustration, is all the neighbors are out harvesting right now. Our crops have more moisture. They're still green. It takes us longer. And it's hard to sit in the barnyard and the neighbors are going up and down the road. <laughs> well, the, the main primary reasons we uh, were interested in getting into no-till was to uh, one, become a little more efficient with our farming operation. Uh, two is for the erosion factor. That was probably our primary reason. Um, and three, we saw the major benefits in uh, our soil health and uh, profitability associated with all that. The main reason we settled on cross slot was due to the fact that it allowed us to go into all different types of crop residues, uh, sustain our crop rotation, um, the ability to grow all the different crops without having to do any type of management of the residues or the soils. Uh, with the other drills that we had tried, we always had to manipulate or manage our, uh, our system so it would work for the drill that we had pulled. And with cross slot, we were able to just go directly into the existing crop without having to do any other type of, of uh, management or tillage to the soil or residues. We have one trip after the after harvest with the sprayer for our fall crops. We're out spraying for volunteer crop as well as weeds. Uh, then the drill's in next. Uh, 
And then for spring crops, we have two trips over, one trip in the fall for volunteer weeds uh, with the sprayer, and then prior to uh, drilling in the spring, we'll, we'll uh, apply some Roundup or glyphosate again right prior to seeding, so two trips in the spring. Well, with cross lot, it has given us a full ability to seed any type of, of uh, crops we wanted to. Uh, in our rotation, we're seeding anything from a winter wheat, uh, spring grains, which would include spring barley, uh, spring wheat. Uh, we also have grass seed in our rotation uh, for seed production, uh, as well as legumes, whether they're lentils, garbanzo beans, or uh, dry peas. Uh, but with cross lot, we are able to, to seed all of those different types of crops into our rotation with having to do nothing prior to the residue management, or to the residue. Maintenance on these drills is, is what we consider low for our uh, conditions. Uh, we have extremely hilly conditions which uh, require heavy side draft uh, on the bearing components and the linkage components. Uh, since we've been pulling these drills since 1998, uh, we've had approximately 6 to 12 bearings that we've had to replace over the, the course of those uh, 10 years. Uh, that's on a 3,000 acre farm. Um, maintenance within that consists of when we do have to break down an opener, we are spending approximately an hour to maintain each opener on our drills. Uh, we have a total of uh, 28 openers that we maintain. So we have 28 hours of maintenance per year, not per season, but per year of uh, maintenance on, the, on our two drills. We're sowing cereals, the wheat, barley, peas, triticale, also some maize. Uh, then we've got the herbage plants, plantain, chicory, uh, things like that, and then the, the range of brassicas that we're sowing in the spring. And then in the autumn, uh, a lot of different pasture type species, grasses and, and clovers, and also cereals in the autumn as well. In terms of setting up the machine, We've really only got a depth setting that we have to vary depending on if we're changing from, from large seeds to small seeds. But other than that, we, we, we haven't got any, any settings that we need to change. Um, we obviously are, we change the, the hydraulic pressure from the cab and uh, the depth, we can go from a range of different soil conditions and field conditions and not have to change the, anything other than the, well, even, the, even the, the seeding depth doesn't have to be changed. The, the main reason I started a business with, con, uh, with Crosslot for contracting is this area has got a, a wide range of soil types uh, ranging from undulating dry sandy ground to damp sand, river silts, stones, peat, you know, a lot of heavy ground and on top of that we have a range of quite a range of farming enterprises in this area and so we sort of needed a machine to, that could handle all of those conditions and I, th I felt the cross lot was the, was the best way to, to do that and as it's panned out it's, it's worked very well. We, if we're not changing from seed sizes we can go from, from extremes of conditions and, and probably not even have to change the, the uh, depth. Mainly, mainly just changing the, the um, oil pressure from the cab to, to give us different down forces in different, in different soils. And um, on top of the soil types, uh, along with the, 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 ranging, the range of, of farming enterprises, we also get a range of, of residue conditions. And the residue handling ability of the cross lot was, was one of the main reasons why I, I thought it was going to be really good in this area. And you know we can go from from having um, very you know hard, a hard bare soil condition to a, to a loose stubble conditions like after maize grain and and everything in between. And uh, in fact, you know one of the things I'm particularly proud of is, uh, is some of my clients are arable farmers with a full complement of cultivation gear, and it's almost like 
the cross lot's their go-to machine in, in some ways because they've got a, a situation that, that they can't handle and they might get me to sow their winter wheat into maize grain stubble or, or someone might have a, a particularly weedy crop that, that's been harvested that their tillage gear won't work in and, and they get me to do that. So There are other, there are other contractors around this area with a range of other machines. I don't think any of them are doing the range of soil types and crop types and field situations that we can do. Um, one, you know, on a typical day in the autumn we might go from, from sowing into, into um, sod conditions that have been sprayed out with glyphosate to, to a green feed maize conditions where there's long stalks on very firm ground to undulating sandy um, undulating sandy country and you just go from one thing to the other and, and virtually not have to change anything and you know you sort of get to the get to the point where you wonder why everybody hasn't got one of these things but just just because it's versatility and then you just turn up to a job and and load it up you know calibrate the seed and just put the hammer down and get going so it's been it's been good Oh, we were uh, conventionally cultivating and uh, trying to grow as much grass as we could and as much crop as we could, but, which was a, a fraction of the amount we grow now. We um, watched your progress for quite a long time and we'd been waiting for cross lot. Um, it, uh, it, it, was, it, it, it wasn't that easy making up our mind, but um, with hindsight it was the best thing we ever did anyhow. Oh, just totally sustainable package and, and uh, so much more productivity. We probably grow twice the area of crop um, on the same ground. We grow more than twice the area of crop because we've got more ground now, but uh, we, we finish more stock on the uh, quality grass and we, we grow more crop because we're uh, the less at risk with the elements. Absolutely, it's, it, it's very much a mixed farm and, uh, and um, cross lot no tillage have um, made it a much better one. We, we're probably finishing twice as much stock um, per hectare as we were to because we put uh, everything in Italian for the winter and then back into um, cash crop for the um, spring summer. You know, the soil health has uh, vastly improved. Just before we uh, changed to uh, no tillage, we were cultivating paddocks up to 13 times and uh, cloddy soil, this is a, a soil that the structure breaks down very quickly with cultivation, so what we were doing wasn't sustainable. And now our soil seems beautiful, it's full of worms and um, be lovely to cultivate it, in fact, it's, it's just nice. Yeah, no, well, it is a, uh, it, it's a total package, the, the cross lot and no tillage, and it's enabled us to expand our operation, and the, uh, my two sons are um, farming on their own account now, and um, no tillage has played a big part in, um, in making that possible. So, um, yeah, no, we're very happy. Mm -hmm.